I'm bored, man. I want to play a video game, but I've already played everything on my shelf. I need something new, something fresh. Wait a minute. What's that? Diablo? Oh, come on, man. The whole killing demons thing and fighting Satan, that was old like 15 years ago. I mean, I need something better than this. I've played it a million times. Great game, but killing demons? I don't know. It's, it's just an old concept. Doom? That's a franchise I haven't heard of in a long time. But what was this doing up there? I don't remember buying it or getting it or hearing any news about it coming out. Is this just like a cheap reboot made to capitalize off of people's nostalgia? Come on, man, that's so fucking lazy. I mean, man, they're probably just resurrecting old game franchises because they've run out of ideas and need to milk money from people somehow. I don't know, I guess we'll check it out. What type of stupid ass Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 garbage is this gonna be? <sighs> all right, well, let's see what this is all about. Oh, I can feel myself getting bored already. Jesus, oh, thank God, oh. This game is gonna kick ass, isn't it? Yes, Doom 2016 certainly kicks ass. It kicks the most ass physically possible. Now, some of you might be thinking and asking, Act Man, why did it take you so long to cover Doom to play it and make a video? And there's a very good answer for that. Shut the fuck up. I'm amazed that I didn't pick this game up sooner. So, thanks to all the people who constantly bugged me, nagged, and harassed me to play it. Yes, even you, Reykjavik, thank you. And I'm even more impressed that Doom 2016 could not only steer the series in the right direction, but could also settle into a nice spot within the ultra-competitive first-person shooter market. Just imagine how hard it is to bring a series back to life when the latest entry came out back in 2004 and arguably wasn't even the same genre of game that the originals were. Doom 3 played more like a horror game from what I recall, but Doom 2016 is a whole different barrel of demons. But has the passage of time made us forget what the Doom series was all about? What defines it? What about the new snap map feature? Was that any good? Or the multiplayer? Does this game truly recapture the magic of the originals in every aspect? Was the transition to modern day rough or smooth? Well, let's smack the shit out of some demons, run with Sanic like speed, and chainsaw our way straight into this. When I think of the most influential video games in this now multi-billion dollar industry, I think of games like Pong, Super Mario Brothers, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter 2, Half-Life 1 and 2, Metal Gear Solid, World of Warcraft, Grand Theft Auto 3, Ocarina of Time, Bioshock, Dark Souls, and of course, Doom. 
But besides Pong and Half-Life and arguably Bioshock, you might have noticed that every game I listed is within a series that encountered unprecedented success and still going strong to this day. Prior to 2016, Doom had essentially fallen off the face of Mars. I mean, everyone who's played a video game knows about it, but for many years I feel like gamers looked at Doom as a series past its prime, that had its golden moment in history and was nothing more than a once influential game that now belongs in a museum. Ironically enough, Duke Nukem and Doom were both going through a period of development hell simultaneously, and when Duke Nukem Forever hit the shelves, it was... it was just... SHIT. So after that colossal blunder, no doubt fans awaiting the next installment of Doom were pretty nervous. I mean, so much had changed since Doom was at the forefront of gaming. Could this iteration really adapt to the current market? Could it do what it did 23 years ago and still be fun and successful? Duke Nukem and Doom were titans of their time that just couldn't seem to claw their way back to mainstream relevance. But that all changed when the Demon Nation attacked. It's pretty goddamn mind-blowing that Bethesda and id Software joined forces to create this game. And yeah, id Software is definitely not made up of the same people back from 1993, but it's the same company, you know? It's part of their identity. What better way to recreate the timeless magic of old gold than through the original company who made it? It's like having Mark Hamill return as Luke Skywalker 34 years later in The Last Jed- Oh god, no. No. Not like that. So instead of droning on about the history of Doom, yada yada yada, I'll just let the man on stage sum it up for me. In 1993, a small studio named id Software made a first-person shooter called Doom that forever changed gaming. First-person shooters became a phenomenon, Deathmatch was born, and Doom became a cultural icon. To this day, Doom is considered one of the most important and influential games in the history of our industry. But the foundation of any Doom experience, past or present, is unquestionably combat that's centered around three things. Badass demons, big effing guns. Yeah. That's right. And moving really, really fast. I think once people heard this short description, they were totally on board and it appeared like id Software and Bethesda knew what people were looking for. The potential for this game to be a complete flop, a total failure, and an insult to the legacy of Doom was massive. But it didn't turn out that way at all. So if you were confused about what kind of tone this game would go for, your confusion is alleviated in the first 40 seconds. Doom lets you know it ain't gonna pull no punches. Nah, instead it fucking throws them. Yeah, right in the face! If you want to talk story, it's pretty simple, and we'll get into that later on, but you wake up on Mars in the midst of a demonic invasion, and you've got to crack some skulls, shatter some kneecaps, and send those wretched creatures screaming back to hell. Oftentimes, video games will have overly tedious tutorials that stop you every five seconds to l let you know how to press the A button, with tons of exposition and explanation of the mechanics, and it can really drone on but not here. Much like the movement of the game itself, Doom gets you up to speed with its mechanics very quickly and doesn't waste your time. Every gun has two methods of fire and partway through the first mission, you're given an attachment by these friendly, cute field drones. And Doom guy says, thanks, you piece of shit. In this tutorial, you're taught how to clamber, explore for secret items, hidden caches of weapons, etc. And every time you pick up a new weapon, you get this cool animation that shows it off gets you acquainted with the design. Within your first couple of fights, you should instantly understand that standing still is a death wish. You should understand how the game is meant to be played. After a 12 year hiatus in one of the most iconic gaming franchises of all time, the importance of a tutorial that teaches you everything you need to know in such a short amount of time cannot be understated. Less tutorial means more demon killing. So you find your sexy-ass, nostalgia-filled power armor that is most certainly not for pussies. You get introduced to some robotic voice, push that fucking monitor out of your face, and they're on your way. Picking up a shotgun and getting straight to work. After shooting your way through an assload of enemies, you arrive at an elevator, and this is where the game really kicks off. I'm willing to take full responsibility for the horrible events of the last 24 hours, but you must understand. 
Our interest in their world was purely for the betterment of mankind. Everything has clearly gotten out of hand now, yes. But it was worth the risk. I assure you. Fuck yeah, you punch that fucking voice, that piece of shit voice. He don't know you. Doom guy is back, baby. These first five minutes are a perfect representation of what to expect throughout the rest of the game, with Doom Guy feeling just as badass, if not more so, to this generation of gamers than he was to gamers back in 1993. Playing through Doom is an experience that gets you fucking jacked, ready to go, ready to kill, and nothing gets you more pumped up than seeing Doom Guy solve every single problem with his fists or an endless stream of bullets. And it's because Doom brings all these radical feelings and emotions out of the player that leads me to my next point. I apologize in advance for the copious amounts of swearing, expletives, and testosterone-fueled rampages in this video, but I can't fucking help it, dude. This game's music and tone gets you hyped like none other. So, Bethesda and id, you're telling me the premise of this game is that I'm the most feared man alive, known to demons as the Doom Slayer, and I get a whoop ass with some of the most awesome weapons, while accompanied by a visceral, hardcore, ear-piercing, bass-pounding, metal-as-fuck soundtrack? Hook it up to my veins! Everything about Doom is a rush. The music, flow of combat, the glory kills. But it's not such a dopamine-filled adventure that doesn't have quiet moments, too. However, there is one core flaw, one crippling, mind-boggling decision that was made behind the scenes that almost makes me want to put Doom down and never play it again. Why is there an option to turn the music off? Who would pick this option, and why is it in the options menu? But seriously, even like going through the options and, and setting your controller inputs and whatnot, listen, listen to the fucking soundtrack. If there is an award category for greatest music that plays while you adjust the brightness, I, I think Doom would win it. There's something otherworldly about Doom's soundtrack. It feels like whatever actions the player makes, the game itself responds and reacts to those actions. When you're mowing down demons and you run up to glory kill them, the soundtrack notices this and almost freezes that moment in time, before whatever godforsaken creature is put down for good. It's like a cinematic hit, like this. This is a game where the player's inputs contribute to the soundtrack. You know, I used to think there were few musical gods in the video game industry, but now I know Mick Gordon is one of them. Like, good job, man. This soundtrack is unlike anything I've ever experienced in a video game. And you people watching this, is there any other soundtrack that sounds at all similar to what you're listening to right now? What's crazy to think is the music for this game was, in my opinion, nearly completely ruined. According to Mick Gordon, imagine if Bethesda and id stayed the course, stuck to their guns and said, No metal music in Doom. Well, thank the fucking Doom Slayer they ended up giving Gordon more creative freedom because otherwise I probably wouldn't be talking about the soundtrack. It would have been some generic sci-fi piece of crap. When the music stops so frequently, yeah, it might get slightly annoying at times, but this is what makes each playthrough unique. The music wasn't created in the simplest way where you just have the piece and play it in the background. Doing that can often result in the music not reflecting what's happening on screen. The moments you enter and exit combat, perform glory kills, or kill a gore nest all have these transitory audio effects which basically means the soundtrack can stop on a dime and move into a different part of the song seamlessly. So by combining Doom's hardcore metal with its quiet pieces and subtle transitions, what we have here is a soundtrack that follows the player and maintains powerful immersion with them throughout the entire game. 
Mick Gordon has created a soundtrack that is never out of sync or out of tune with the player's actions, and that to me is unheard of. But I just went on a huge tangent. Where was I? Oh yeah, that's right. The feeling Doom gives the player, the feeling of complete control. Whenever I talk about controls in a game review, I'll usually say one or two sentences about it if it's awesome, and plenty more if it's bad. Because similar to the user interface, it's the type of thing that you just don't really notice unless something is wrong with it. Or, it's really, really good. Contrary to Doom 3, the 2016 version is empowerment captured in its purest form. Because horror games are meant to strip you of your power in order to frighten the player and make it seem like you can't actually battle this threat. Doom Guy is always in control, and therefore, so are you. He seeks revenge, doesn't back down, doesn't use stealth, doesn't hide, that shit's for pussies. You hear that, Solid Snake? Now at first, playing Doom felt strange to me. I wasn't used to moving this fast without having to lower my gun and sprint. I wasn't accustomed to not constantly mashing the X button to reload after every firefight. I wasn't used to playing a shooter that gave me a map screen, that rewarded me for exploring. And then I realized that throughout the majority of my time playing shooter campaigns, many of the FPS games that employ these mechanics were actually hindering my fun. I spent so much time getting accustomed to modern AAA games and how similar they all are, how linear, how by the books, that I forgot there are actual benefits to removing sprint, linearity, and yes, even reloading in a first-person shooter. Of course, not every game should try to copy Doom, but the point I want to make is the game ends up feeling so unique because these mechanics aren't disrupting the flow of gameplay at all. Let's talk about quick time events. Oh yes! The thing that most gamers would tell you is an unnecessary cheap gimmick that adds nothing to the game. Press F to pay respects. Anyone remember that meme? That was the pinnacle of quick time events. Oh, but in Doom? Yeah, they actually work in here because if you open a door, you have to actually fucking open it. I don't know about you, but part of me always felt it was kind of weird when you were playing a shooter and your character was supposed to open a door, press a button, flip a vehicle, or whatever, and it did it automatically. It's not a bad thing though because it keeps you in control, but in order to make the player feel the beats of the game, the combat, the quiet, and everything in between, these quick time events serve as those natural momentary pauses. They give you a much needed chance to breathe. They are exactly that. Quick. No button mashing bullshit. There's no tedious factor to this. Part of the fun of Doom comes from watching how Doom Guy handles things around him. Whether he's pushing a button, pulling a key card off a corpse, punching a field drone. We all get a sense of Doom Guy through the sum of all these small actions. Boy. I never thought I'd spend any amount of time talking about quick time events in a video game without mentioning how shit most of them are. Resident Evil 4 made me accept quick time events, but Doom 2016 made me like them. So now that we know the control is fucking perfect, what's the next logical step? The gameplay. I love how barely half a year after Doom came out, companies such as EA started saying shit like, Oi mate, gamers don't want linear single player games. Crikey. You can't make as much money off a single player because it's not a live service. Andrew Wilson, you're absolutely right. What we need is more of this. Because this is way more cool and fun than this. Doom is the perfect example of why this sentiment needs to fuck off. At its core, Doom is unapologetic. The game could care less about how the industry has warped your expectations since its long hiatus. It's hard to figure out where I need to go, says the gamer. Fuck you, replies Doom. Figure it out. 
What are you, a bitch? Can't find your way through hell? Here, take this copy of Kitty Cat Squirt Gun Battle. You can play it over at Weenie Hut Juniors. I'm sure you'll feel right at home, pussy. I love this. Doom does its own thing, fully commits to it, and doesn't baby talk the player. You'd think that in this day and age of ultra-sensitive pussies and the widespread plague of the cult of outrage, that a series that has been mired in controversies and accused of inspiring mass shootings would, uh, y you know, maybe try to play it a little safe? Wouldn't want Doom Guy to be too masculine because then the women's might feel the imaginary firm grip of the patriarchy around their throats. Oh, you better not show gratuitous violence because that's bad and OMG, there's been 8 billion shootings across the world since Doom came out. Coincidence? Whoa, 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 you can't show that satanic imagery. That's gonna recruit young kids into worshipping Satan. Inside of these video games is, is actually the devil and the demons. Amongst all this bullshit people are throwing onto the game industry, Doom doesn't give a flying fuck. You either play it and like it or don't and it doesn't care. It's so fucking sweet and awesome when you realize Doom 2016 is essentially the release of all the pent-up frustration of gamers in the gaming community from being attacked over the years. That older men were using Grand Theft Auto 3 as a murder and carjacking simulator. Eat a dick, Jack Thompson. You think you can talk shit about GTA and get away with it? Distilled down to its essence, the plot device works by trading the disempowerment of female characters for the empowerment of male characters. Get destroyed, Anita. You're too fragile for this hardcore shit. He was trained to kill Call of Duty. Suck on this, Christians. Oh no, the children are gonna be indoctrinated into joining Satanist cults? Ha! Ha <laughs> You fucking idiots, don't make me laugh! Woo! It feels so good. The, the sweet release. Hardcore metal and badassery aside, let's actually discuss gameplay. Well, without a doubt, Doom 2016 took heavy inspiration from its origins. The flow of combat, a variety of enemies with different strengths and weaknesses, secret areas, and an uncompromising commitment to fun. Doom gives new meaning to the phrase, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The game is based around the concepts of moving fast to dodge incoming attacks while focusing on shooting. You'll notice there's no need for sprint, there's no need for thruster packs, there's no need for ground pounds or wall running or grappling hooks, there's no need for aiming down sights. It is as classic and cool as it gets, and it parallels the designs of the original games pretty much perfectly. Throughout the game, your arsenal of weapons gets larger, as does the difficulty and combination of enemies. The weapons and sandbox of this game is incredibly fun and versatile. The double-barreled shotgun is devastating up close. The minigun lets you spray bullets all over the place. Plasma rifle lets you suppress the enemies and burn them to a crisp. The chainsaw lets you mutilate those pathetic demons, and the BFG is your get out of jail free card. I could go on and on about the weapons and how perfect they are in tandem with the enemies and just how fun they are to use, but I want to take a minute to segue into the design of the enemies. As explained by Mark Brown in his video, What We Can Learn From Doom, what makes the game so fun is the straightforward design of every single enemy and how the game makes the player understand what each one of them does. I highly recommend watching that video because it's incredibly relevant to this game just as it was for the original. But we see this unique design from the lowly possessed all the way up to the intimidating barons of hell. You will never be confused by the tactics the enemies use against you. For example, imps are rather weak up close but have numbers on their side and throw fireballs from range. Hellraisers are the snipers which will try to take you out from afar, forcing you to dodge their attacks and get up in their face. Hell Knights are burly, up-close brawlers that put the pressure on you. Summoners are floating, telekinetic supporters. Every enemy has its strengths, weaknesses, and strategies. For instance, the Kako Demons are huge balls that hover in the air, making close weapons like the shotgun not as useful. However, the Goss Cannon is perfect against them because they are such a big target and don't move fast. Similarly, the Mancubus is an armored, fat-ass tank that can be easily outmaneuvered, but deadly up close if you're not careful. All the demons have weak points which you'll learn to exploit over time, like the Pinkies who will charge recklessly at you and leave their backs exposed. To summarize the core gameplay, I'll paraphrase and reiterate what Mark Brown said. 
The secret of Doom's fun factor is in the nitty gritty combat and how every battle turns into something of a dance of careful positioning and rapid fire decisions. And in fact, the game has made several improvements from its original, where oftentimes you would have to backtrack to find health packs, armor, ammo, that sort of thing if you got to a tough area, but this time, there's a workaround for that. Going for glory kills will ensure health drops, and chainsaw kills will automatically give you more ammo. So it's not as unforgiving as the original. They really nailed all the little details, like being able to set your weapon in the classic placement. I honestly believe these types of design choices could have only been made by a company that truly cared about fan service and the fans. There's so many little things I probably wouldn't notice or mention, but that I'm sure the hardcore fans will appreciate to no end. But behind the actual combat lies a lot of depth and a surprising amount of customization. The game is heavily based around the concept of exploration, discovery, and progression, and it's got some very appreciated light RPG mechanics. Some of the secrets require you to be attentive to your surroundings. You need to think critically if you want the reward. There's tons of secret areas that'll give you special ammo, collectibles, armor, health, etc. Now, one of the few gripes I have with Doom is if you're even a little bit OCD about collecting things, you'll be checking your map constantly, which can interrupt the game. But that's really just a personal thing. So by exploring the levels around you and not trying to race through the game as fast as possible, you are rewarded with upgrade tokens for your guns, your armor, and attachments for your weapons. There's also Argent Energy Capsules, which permanently increase your health, ammo, or armor, giving you a choice of what you think you need most. One of the coolest things about Doom are the secret levers, hidden in every single mission. Which are hard to find and reveal a throwback level from the original game, which also unlocks a classic level. I was blown away the first time I found one. That type of throwback is very much appreciated, and the transition between the old and new graphics was hilarious to witness and a symbol of how far we've come since then. But it's not just through the secrets within each level that your character becomes stronger. You've got rune trials, which give you passive bonuses. They're unique, can fit your playstyle, so it's essential to unlock each one. And each level has its own set of challenges, which earn you weapon upgrade tokens. There's challenges for your guns, doing special things with them, or killing a certain number of enemies in a time frame will allow you to get the strongest weapons possible. The best thing about Doom's campaign is you're not just mindlessly shooting demons down a linear path until the game ends, but you're trying to get the most upgrades possible. You're strategically thinking about what to unlock and when. It's all about finding which weapons you like best, which attachment suits you, and what to invest your points in, which adds a lot of variety to each and every playthrough of Doom. Classic video game power-ups also make a return. You've got stuff like Haste, which turns you into a manlier version of Sonic. There's Quad Damage, which gives you quad damage. And my personal favorite, Berserk, which gives you the combined strength of Mike Tyson, Andre the Giant, The Rock, John Cena, and every single person that's ever been strong and lets you punch any demon, big or small, for the insta-kill. God, I love these animations. Now to rewind back to quick time events, once again, in combat they work just as well, but renamed glory kills. And these are fucking epic. It shows how badass Doom Guy is. He doesn't just shoot the demons, he rips their eyes out, tears off their horns and stabs them with it. They'll crush their skulls with the might of a thousand paladins. Performing glory kills not only rewards you with health drops, but gives you a sick animation to watch. The game is giving you positive reinforcement through the gameplay and visuals. Combined with the sick as fuck Mick Gordon soundtrack, Doom 2016's campaign and gameplay is one of the best single player first person shooters I've ever played. Especially in this current era of gaming where companies think investing in single player modes isn't worth it. Doom lets everyone in the industry know just how fucking stupid that is. So before we jump into the multiplayer, let's discuss the story briefly. 
Well, unlike most PlayStation exclusives that bludgeon you over the head with 30-minute photorealistic unskippable cutscenes played by famous film actors, Doom's story is a lot more subdued. Now, I'm not talking shit about those PlayStation games, I'm just saying sometimes you just want to play. Essentially, you are the Doom Slayer, a man so notorious and powerful the tides of hell trembled in fear against his unstoppable onslaught. He scoured the umbral plains, seeking vengeance against the Dark Lords who had wronged him. He wore the crown of the Night Sentinels, and those that tasted the bite of his sword named him the Doom Slayer. Side note, it's really cool you get some backstory and insight into the Doom Slayer when you're actually in hell. I thought that was a really neat touch. Anyways, your goal is to stop the demonic invasion on Mars, and to do this you work with Vega, an artificial intelligence, and Samuel Hayden, a man who turned into a robot. And the woman responsible for this is Olivia Pierce. The plot that unravels is your typical sci-fi, humans try to capture and harness an extremely dangerous and volatile energy, alien or whatever, it ends up going terribly wrong and you've got to save the day. Ripley, think of all we can learn from it. It's the chance of a lifetime. It's predictable and not the most engaging story. However, as George Lucas once said, It's stylistically designed to be that way and you can't undo that, but we can diminish the effects of it. Because if Doom's story was any more engaged, any more emphasized, any more forced, it would take away from Doom Guy's role in it. Your role. Doom Guy is there to kill demons and fuck them up. The story is there to set the framework for the gameplay and give you an excuse to run around shooting things. In this sense, if the story had twice as many cutscenes and dialogue, it would just add a forced narrative. So I can understand if people were disappointed with the story, but this way it shifts the emphasis onto the gameplay itself, which is much more engaging. However, to combat this lackluster narrative, the game includes plenty of codexes, lore, history, and things to read. This was the perfect choice, because it allows the player to learn more about the world, universe, lore, and history on their own time instead of on the game's time. What I love about Doom Guy is how his actions are the polar opposite of most video game protagonists. You know, when Cortana tells you to walk into that glowing beam of light, you do it because she told you to, because she knows where the next mission's gonna take place. Or when Woods tells you to keep quiet so you can sneak through the Soviet forces, you know, you do it because he told you to. But Doom Guy doesn't need a fucking guide. We're only temporarily disabling the tower. You need to remove each lens individually. Carefully release the hinges. He doesn't need to do what people tell him to. In a nutshell, Doom's story is downplayed so that the gameplay is given more opportunities to shine, so that forced cutscenes and a forced narrative don't distract from what is at the heart of the experience. And if you care to learn more, it's all there in the brilliantly written and intriguing codex. But how does the multiplayer fare? Because Doom back in its heyday wasn't just about the single player, you had maps, mods, modes, ports. The beginnings of the online era of gaming really started here. So 23 years later and here we are. And it's underwhelming to say the least. But not in the sense that it just plain old sucks like Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Doom's multiplayer is underwhelming, similar to Halo 4, because of a failure to recapture the series' identity. And wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, it's the same company that helped create both. Certain Affinity. Don't get me wrong, it's not an awful multiplayer component. It can be pretty fun, and honestly, it's refreshing because it's different. But the problem is Doom's single player stayed true to its origins, and the multiplayer does not. It has been modernized. May I ask a simple question? Who the hell asked for loadouts in an arena shooter? What's the point? Oh, oh, I'll tell you. It's because multiplayer games can't just be good fun. They need to have a progression system. You need to unlock stuff so you feel good even if you suck. They got these demon power-ups which let you take control of a demon. It essentially acts in a very similar way to ordnance drops, which is kind of scary to think about. 
adding that random power spike to whichever lucky player happens upon it. You know, it's pretty cool, it spices things up, letting you play as the demon, so I'm not hating on that. And yes, even the loadouts are fun to customize, but, it, but it's just, it's not what Doom was about. And I'll say it right now, this multiplayer is leagues better than Halo 4. It's got a bunch of super creative game modes like freeze tag, it has incredible versatile map design, there's plenty of ways to maneuver around unique gimmicks like going out into space. The actual gameplay is pretty great, the shooting, the controls, all of it's pretty fun. So back to loadouts, the classic arena shooters of the olden days were all about running around the map super fast, picking up weapons, and collecting an arsenal. Not only was movement fast, but player reaction times had to be as well. You couldn't pause or slow down the game to switch to the right weapon for the current situation. You had to do that in the heat of the moment. I just don't see any good reason why the entire multiplayer had to be designed around a two-weapon loadout system. At least have some type of mode or playlist that's classic that gives players the classic Arena Doom experience. Another thing that bugs me is the announcer. Warpath, secure and defend the zone. You know how games like Unreal Tournament, Quake, and Halo all kind of started this trend of badass announcers? Yeah, that's one of the core pieces of an arena shooter. First blood. However, despite how fucking cool Doom is stylistically, the choice of announcer, while fitting with the story, is lame. Incoming ghost town. Vega doesn't sound Doom-like, he didn't need to be the announcer, and his pleasant robotic demeanor doesn't represent the kick-ass gameplay all that well. The other piece of modernization is, and I couldn't even believe it when I saw it, couldn't even believe it after playing the multiplayer, fucking emotes. Really? Really? Let, let's say someone comes to Doom and they never played the original games, never saw much about them, but knows about the series, and they hop straight into the multiplayer and they see this. And you know what they're gonna think? They're gonna be like, wow. So this is what Doom is about. Wow, I didn't realize this game was so gay. Like, what was the conversation they had in the board meeting? Hey, we've got this super awesome single player revolving around killing demons with kick-ass weapons, but what should we add into the multiplayer to make it more cool and hip? Oh, I know. Why don't we give players the options to dance around like a goddamn cheerleader? That's cool. That's what the kids like these days, yeah? These emotes are lame, dude. They are so lame in contrast to how kick-ass the rest of the experience is. The modernization of Doom's multiplayer is lame and totally contradicts that masterpiece of a single player because the campaign stayed true to its roots while the multiplayer did not. Multiplayer has the same principles as the campaign. They just play differently. It's pretty fun for casual play and I kind of like it that way because it's something that doesn't draw your focus away from the main attraction. At least Doom's multiplayer didn't try to be a fucking eSport. So for this section, I'm going to throw in difficulty, snap map, and overall content into one. Now, I've never been terribly good at using in-game tools to create maps, whether it be StarCraft, WarCraft 3 custom games, Gmod, Forge from Halo. It's a real shame that I can't dedicate more time to these things and actually finish maps because all that time goes to making videos. Yeah, the thing you're watching. The snap map in Doom is pretty incredible, and I only got a taste of it just messing around. And I'm judging that based on what I can see it do, what's possible. I mean, it's really given Halo 5 a run for its money. But come to think of it, the armor customization kind of looks like Halo a bit, hmm? And they got this mode Clan Arena, which, hmm, kind of seems like Breakout. Anyways, these types of modes and tools, when given to the player, ensure the game will never run out of content. Scrolling through these menus, it's pretty overwhelming too. I mean, I don't even know where to start. The fact that you can actually script AI and enemies in a console game is not only revolutionary, but it just opens up so many possibilities. People have created things like farming simulators, escort missions, custom single player levels, you name it. It's all here. So there's a mode for the more creative, artistic driven gamers to experiment with. For my first playthrough, I chose Hurt Me Plenty difficulty, aka normal mode, and it was fun yet challenging. 
I think it speaks volumes to how well tuned the challenge is when I can say I was never frustrated or felt like I hit a wall. The only thing that annoyed me was some platforming stuff, but that's just because I was playing like a fucking idiot. So now that I've beaten the game, now that I know the mechanics, I can't wait to up the ante and play it on Ultra Violence, Nightmare, or even Ultra Nightmare. Replayability for the campaign is very strong. It's definitely appealing to completionists and those that want to find every nook, cranny, and secret the game has to offer. And just in case you thought you'd experienced it all, there's an arcade mode too. If you don't want to worry about collectibles or weapon upgrades or anything, this is the mode for you. It's great to kick back and play this without the commitment of really having to pay attention to the finer details. But wait, there's more. Right now, if you pull that lever and find the secret entrance, we'll throw in the ability to play classic Doom levels for free. And what a trip it is, honestly. I mean, goddamn, Doom is absolutely loaded with content. From the campaign to arcade mode, throwback levels, snap map, multiplayer, it's beyond worth its initial price tag. And if you're ever having a discussion about what a game should offer for 60 bucks, make sure you bring up Doom, because it's the front runner, the paragon. The game gives you the ultimate fan service, the ultimate variety, and packs in a few surprises that you wouldn't expect. And that's the real kicker for video games. When a company is able to put so much effort into making their product that the consumers are surprised by how much bang they got for their buck. I am so happy I finally decided to check out Doom 2016, and I just had to make a video on it, even though I'm two years late, and we're already coming up on the sequel Doom Eternal. I think gamers throughout all these years have needed something like Doom to be one of the frontrunners of the game industry, to represent us, this hobby we love and the fun we enjoy. The long hiatus of Doom, one of the top three most influential gaming franchises, needed to end. It's almost like modern gaming had lost its way without Doom to remind people what was special about video games and shooters in the first place. Doom needs a place in the industry, because Mario is like the front man who makes all the non-gaming folk feel like it's a cheerful, happy place, and then Doom guy strolls in, smacks them right in the face, and tells them it ain't all rainbows and daisies, there's hardcore shit in here too. The snap mat feature was a welcome addition, and you know, whatever limitations you see it having, this is a great stepping stone to something epic, something to rival the forge mode in Halo. This is going to force other companies to step up their game if they want to compete with Doom. The soundtrack was simply stunning, enemy design phenomenal, story passable, and core gameplay unparalleled. The single player is simply a masterpiece that any fan of shooters needs to play. If you haven't already, you need to experience this for yourself to truly appreciate it. While the multiplayer doesn't stay true to its roots, it can still be a lot of fun to play if you can get over the modernization. Doom 2016 could have easily been a vapid, poor excuse of a game made only to sell itself based off nostalgia. Doom wasn't just a callback to the origins of first-person shooters. It was also a return to form. And that is why Doom 2016 is so awesome.